for novice bettors. Learn your betting terminology, theories, and strategies. Avoid common mistakes and enhance your overall betting experience. Learn how it works and how to win. Class is in session. It's time for Betting 101. Welcome to it. Time to take some notes. The professor, Josh Towers, is here. My name is Sam Padianovich for Betting 101. Today, we're talking some baseball because, Josh, as you know, a lot of people know how to bet football with the point spread and the totals and basketball very popular as well. But when people walk up to a baseball board here in Vegas, they're usually perplexed. Not an easy sport to bet for the novice. Starting, uh, it looks a little bit different, right? You're used to laying points. Where's the negative or positive number? And all of a sudden, you just got three digits. And yeah, it gets a little confusing at times. But uh, listen, I'll tell you what, I wish that I'd heard some shows like this when I first started betting. It probably would have saved me a couple months on losing. So you've got the money line, you've got the yes, run sir. line and the total, and we'll talk later on about win totals and futures, and I know your favorite bet is the uh, first five inning bet, so we can get into all this here on VEASAN. But we'll start with the basic money line, and Matt Jones, producing this show, has put up a game board here. Let's just take Team A against Team B, and we'll start simple with the money line. Now, Team A, we'll say they're favored. Let's say they're about minus 150 here, which means you have to lay 150 on the road. So that's probably uh, a Red Sox team on the road, right, with uh, David Price on the hill, perhaps. The team with the minus is favored. And the money line, Josh, you have to lay 150 to win 100. On the flip side of that, we'll say it's a dime line. And Team B comes back at plus 140. So the plus means if you put down 100, that wins you 140 here. But, of course, the minus is the favorite. That's the better team and more likely the better starting pitcher because a lot of these lines are rotated around the starting pitcher. So to start this exercise, Sammy basically went – a little bit less version of Boston at Baltimore to start the year at minus 150 on the road. You might want to stay away from that one. Um, No, you're right, though. Can you explain to me real quick what the dime line is? Because I know you said that, and I understand it, but if we're talking betting 101, minus 110 is how we start bets. So on on, on a typical bet, it's going to be minus 110 across the board, even if it's even, meaning I have to lay $110 or 11 to win 100 or win $10. Um, yeah, the but, dime line is just a 10 cent difference between yeah. the favorite and the dog. So minus 150 and plus 140. If you get a Yankee and a Marlin game, sometimes that's, you know, you get a 20 cent line. It could be, you know, minus 200 and plus 180. It all depends on the big teams. And we know the Yankees and the Dodgers and the Red Sox. They're more popularly bet. People walk up to the window, and they love to bet on those teams. So oftentimes, there's a tax on the money line. For example, say the line could be 170. If it's the Yankees, it might be $2 just because of all the influx of money that always comes in on the Bronx Bombers. Yeah, and so as we get into this, there's so many different variations, obviously, of how to bet this. And and one of the most important things, and and you can listen to any show on VEASAN, and it's, it's said quite often, try to find the best line. And in baseball, more than any line, I think you'll see differences because where it's bet and how much money comes in at each particular place is going to change the line a little bit where we might get 180 here, you might see 187 somewhere else. And so if you have the ability to shop around and to look for different lines, I know it may not seem like a lot in the beginning, but it turns out to be, if you bet a lot, it turns out to be a huge thing uh, getting the wrong side or the bright side of a line. And it could save you a lot of money or make you a lot of money. So that minus 150, that's very simple. You lay the juice, but all you have to do is win the game. doesn't matter by how many runs. If you win 4-3, to three, you win 10-7, to seven, you win 21-19, to 19, whatever. All that matters is Team A has to win the game. And that minus 150 bet, you walk up to the sports book, you take Team A, You lay down 150, and if you win, you come back. You get the 150 back plus the 100. You get 250 when you walk away. If you take Team B, they're the underdog at plus 140. They need to just win the game outright. That $100 turns into 140. So back at the counter, you walk up, you hand them your ticket, and you get 240. If this was, say, the best team in the league against the worst team in the league, so we're talking about you know, the Red Sox against the Marlins, who have done their best to uh, implode everything, right? They had a good young core. Yes, they they got rid of everything. If this is Red Sox at the Marlins, this line could be minus 250 for Team A. Which is crazy to see a road team favored so much. Uh, but you're 100% right. And, and, and whew, there's dangers. I mean, we're going to talk about a lot of things. You might want to stay away from that one. Those become dangerous when you're betting huge favorites on the road. Um, but you're right. And listen, here, here's the thing. We're picking the winner, and I know at times that sounds easier, that sounds hard. Uh, There's certain lines that you want to look for. There's certain lines you want to stay away from, and hopefully we talk about and get into that a little bit. But keep in mind, if you really did your homework and you really find a team you like, it's not 
don't get scared away at laying 170. Don't get scared away at laying 150. However, in football, like I said, I might be laying four points at minus 110. Here, I might have to lay 160. At the end of the day, if you're on the right side, you're on the right side. You do not want to drink a lot of juice, though. I think the limit 100%. should be about 180, and I, I hate laying 180 at that price. Um, you know, 150, 160 to me, everybody's different. We'll get into the run line later because when if you, you have a $2 favorite, you could go run line, which we'll get into in a when second. When you say that, because you do have a limit, and I like that, um, are, you t- are you talking about maybe at home? Are you talking about on the road? Or are you talking about just overall the game itself? Well, the more juice you lay – the better success you have to have Correct. on a game by game basis. So if you're laying, you know, 180 a game, that winning 55% of your games is not going to put you over the top. You're going to have to win about 63, 64% of your bets, if not even more, to come over the top of all that juice. Because there was a guy by the name of Cliff Lee. I know you know Cliff well. Yes, sir. When he was a Texas Ranger, there were games, I want to say about 2010, 2011, he was laying $4 at home which means to bet on the Indians or the Rangers, because he was an Indian, then he got traded. He had to lay about $4, which means you had to put $400 to win 100 If you lose one of those games, you've got to win five just to break even. So I'll give you an example. We had talked about this during the season a lot. There Before last year, because we started to see a lot of minus 350s uh, or higher. We started to see a lot of that. And, and before that became popular, the last 35 minus 352s or higher, they were 28 and 7, meaning they won 20 out of the games and uh, lost 7 of the games. And they lost money overall. Oh, yeah. Because like you just said, when you're laying minus 400 to win 100, when you lose that, What's you got to make what's up, seven times four. You got to make twenty eight hundred ground, yeah. And so it, those become very dangerous. And I know when you see a minus four hundred, meaning they are favored, it, the book is basically telling us this team is is going to win, no question about it. But when they don't, you find yourself in a hole. And then when we start to, which we'll talk about later, you start to add that to a parlay, it becomes very dangerous as well because those are, those are tough holes to come back from. It's a lot of money. Clayton Kershaw was a four twenty five favorite last year. I believe it was against the Marlins. If I am correct, I think he was a 425 favorite at home against the Marlins, and he lost. Well, and there were people that were walking up, and they were putting the Dodgers in parlays. Oh, yeah. They were laying the run line. They were laying the money line. That's $42 to win 10, and people bet it, and they went home a little salty because Kershaw did not have a good outing. That's baseball, though. That's life in the league. You can have a bad yeah. start. That's why I would never ever lay 425 to win 100. We forget that even though some teams are good and some teams are bad, we forget that they're all professional athletes at the highest level and they wouldn't be there if at one point in their life they weren't pretty successful. We had had a bet last year. It was the doubleheader in New York versus the Royals. Uh, Brad Keller was facing Severino in game one. Severino was minus four and some change, and he lost. Keller had won that, and I remember that specifically because we had jumped on Keller, who was pitching phenomenal at the time, had a really good season last year, and Severino had started to come through his struggles, but we got the Yankees facing the Royals, a first place or second place team versus one of the worst, and it makes sense to the books. Very dangerous play. It did create some value, though, on the underdog. Because at that time, wasn't Severino, I think they had won 18 of his first 20 starts last year. Started off phenomenal. So there was an extra tax. Rather than make the line 375, minus 375, Severino was about minus 420. On to the run line. And this is where things get a little complicated if you're not an everyday baseball better. So here's what this means. The run line is a run and a half. So you take this favorite, Team A, which is a minus 150 favorite on the money line. There's a separate price and a separate category on the screen for you for the run line. This is a run and a half bet. So if you're taking Team A, what you now have to do, the objective now, is to win this game by two runs or more. And your average run line, and these will fluctuate depending on the team and the league. If Team A is minus 150, ballpark run line is plus 120. Now here's what that means. We're throwing a lot of numbers at you and a lot of prices. You have to win by more than a run and a half, hence the minus 1.5, but the payout is different. Josh, notice the money line is minus 150, but if you lay the run line minus one and a half and Team A wins by two, three, four, five, whatever, that $100 becomes 120 plus the 120. And it becomes enticing, it becomes inviting, and it goes, okay, Boston should beat the Marlins all day. Right, So it's like, of course, they're going to win by more than one run. And so we lay the one and a half, but because we're laying more runs, you get a better price of plus 120 in this situation. It's not as easy as it sounds. And sometimes we get lured into that. you got to remember, 
uh, depending on the games in baseball, situational baseball, if there's a runner on first late in the game, I'm going to bunt them over to try to drive them in to maybe tie the game or take that one-run lead. Baseball becomes a game full of one-run games quite often, uh, unless it gets out of hand early. But you got to understand how games are strategized towards the end pitching matchups, situational baseball, to get back to giving ourselves a chance to be one swing away. So one-run games aren't that far-fetched. I'll give you a little example. I went over this yesterday. I looked at Boston's schedule just in April last year, uh, and obviously they were probably favored in the majority of their games. Maybe when they played the Yankees, it was probably off a little bit early. But 28 games in April, 18 of their games were decided by two runs or more. 13 of those games were won by Boston. So... If they're favored in every game, most of us assume that they're just going to roll, especially how good the Red Sox were last year. And the reality is, is 18 is probably a high number, 18 to 20 games, 28 games decided by two, 13 of the 28 Boston won. So not even at a 50% clip. So if we start falling into this too much, we could also find ourselves in trouble. On the flip side of that, Team B now has a different price. Now you can take a run and a half. But it's not as simple as plus 140 anymore. Now you're the favorite. Now you're laying to win. So Team B, let's just say ballpark here, Jones E, they're plus a run and a half at minus 150. So now everything has changed. You went from the underdog to win the game, which you are. If you're the dog here, you don't have the greatest starting pitcher and maybe the offense is struggling. You're plus 140 to win the game on the money line. But on the far right side of your screen, Run line is now different. Plus one and a half runs, which means if you lose four to three, you're a winner. Pitching, but the tax is real. From plus 140 on the money line to take the run and a half, you have to lay 150 to win 100. And so this this is where actually watching and maybe taking some notes if you're going to risk your money comes into play. In in our particular scenario, a a lot of – you know, you, you have a little bit more value at home. Home teams seem to come through a little bit more often. And whenever I'm getting plus money at home, it's something that I immediately look at as a team to see if this is something I like. And if I feel like this team has a chance or can win, I then go over to the run line and say, okay, I'm getting one and a half at minus 150. I'm starting the game winning. And even if I give up one, I'm still winning this game. And so you start breaking down the game and say, okay, there probably is some value here or there's not value here. We've got to get a little bit deeper with our, once again, investigations. But it can become a great bet, especially in our scenario where you're getting one and a half at home. And here's the benefit of that plus one and a half if you're the home team, the home dog. You get that plus one and a half, say you're down five to three going in at the bottom of the ninth. You get last bats. You don't even have to win the game to win the bet. You can scratch across one run. The game is five to four final. The team doesn't win, but five and four. Plus one and a half, you're a winner. Which is where we got to run around first and one out and we're down two and I might be holding him on. I may not. I might play a little bit loose. That run doesn't mean anything to me. The runner at, at home plate, the batter is what matters in this situation. So yeah, we we might just take the out of first and give up the second base and then there's a single. And So there's a lot of different scenarios that come into play. Uh, it, you know, Once again, understand all of this, take as much information as you can, and you start to find out what... There's no exact science, right, Sammy, on this? We're just trying to put ourselves in a position to have a little bit more success than other places? Yes. There has been a couple situations over the years where I have taken the home team plus a run and a half, down by two runs, runner a third, one out, infield deep. I love to see it because that run means nothing to the the winning team. The manager doesn't care how much you win by. All you got to do is win the game. And then there's a hot shot, second base. Second baseman pops it twice, throws the first, two outs, but the run scores, and all of a sudden – I'm covering the one and a half. You're, uh, you're, you're, you're kind of making me upset right now by giving scenarios like that because as a pitcher, <laughs> it's so very important that I don't give up a run and my ERA doesn't go up. And whenever we see situations like that, oh, I completely understand we're just trying to win the game, but it's very personal to us at times. And so when we see that situation, we understand what's going on, but we are trying our best to not give up that run. Most players, most pitchers don't care yeah. about this stuff in Vegas. but They don't care about any of this, right? You spent almost a decade in the show. Mm -hmm. Do some players pay attention? Do they know when they're the underdog? Do they know when they're a huge favorite? It's it's becoming such a different day and age now where now we know that gambling's legal in most states and and now we have VEASAN and, and things are being broadcasted so it's a little bit more now ESPN talks about bad beats and we see bottom line sometimes of different numbers on different sporting events so it's a little bit more out there to where we're accidentally seeing it without looking for it 
my last year was 2010. And to be honest with you, although in Toronto, I knew on the corners of the stores you could bet, but you had to parlay. You didn't really pay attention to it. So Toronto did have it on the screen. It wasn't something that you really focused on or paid attention to. It, it honestly didn't matter. There's so many games where I, I could not tell you, maybe all of them, if I was the dog or if I was the favorite. Not just me personally, but our team was the dog or the favorite. I have no idea. could never tell you what a run line was. Uh, totals, no clue. Could never, never knew what a total was. I'm glad you brought the total up. That's the last part of our first segment here. So in this game, Team A against Team B, let's just say the total is seven and a half. So you have two pretty decent pitchers on the hill here. It's very simple. Over or under. And we'll call this a flat total. So it's minus 110 each way. Here's the gist of it. You go over seven and a half or you go under seven and a half. That's combined runs between team A and team B. If you go over, you need eight or more. If you go under, you need seven or less. The average Josh Towers game, I'm going to guess, was about eight. <laughs> That's messed up. That's an average. What do you mean? That's an average total for a game. It was. Oh, was, I could have said 10 or 11. It was the smirk on your face looking at me <laughs> as you said it. It was, that was not. messed up. Right, well, you're Jonesy? the professor now. That. Yeah, you're the I, professor. I it too. A little. A little condescending there it was <laughs> somebody back me up eight is the average baseball game that's you know verlander scherzer well that's probably seven seven and a half but appreciate, either way i appreciate you calling me average and put me in the same sentence with i said verlander average and baseball game no, average, average total is eight in a baseball game we have seen totals how about a total last year i believe it was scherzer and kershaw that total was six and a half oh uh, we, we're getting them low six and a half seven used to be the the floor now we're seeing them even lower than that and it all depends too like totals it we could talk about totals forever because now you're talking about who's pitching on what side. We're talking about day. We're talking about night. Ballpark. Uh, we're talking about how much of the bullpen was used the day before. We're talking about ballparks like you just said. Totals. First field has totals in the 13-14 range sometimes. And it, yeah, you get a seven and a half at the same, you know, maybe in, in L.A. in the same night you got a 13 in Colorado. It, 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 they're dangerous. They're tough. They're fun. Uh, another thing that you have to do your homework on. But, yes, now we're inviting both teams together to either score over or stay under that total. Um, I, I struggle with totals. i got to be honest with you. I have a hard time betting these. Well, you got to keep listening to Betting 101. I hear you. We'll straighten it out. He's the professor, Josh Towers. My name is Sam Panionovich. Coming up, overnight lines, the importance of pitchers, bullpens, and also the ever-important first five-inning bet. That's next here on VEASAN. Next big event, obviously March Madness. Uh, we're expecting an absolute crazy crowd here. Uh, we have two two big VIP parties within Caesars, uh, one at Flamingo, one at Planet Hollywood, and the new book here at the Link. Uh, we've gotten we've got we've gotten quite a, a few reservations already uh, for this space, and we are expecting it to, to live up to its namesake. So the next big thing uh, up uh, for betters is March Madness, and which uh, here in Vegas, if you've never been to a March Madness in Vegas. You're missing out. It's definitely a bucket list type of event. Um, large crowds, great party atmosphere, and a plethora of just outstanding college basketball games. Obviously, I think the next big event that betters are looking forward to would probably be the tournament week for basketball, you know, and March Madness altogether. Um, me personally, I think I'm looking forward to the start of the Alliance of American Football. Uh, I'm really excited to see a new sport come along that I have a chance to make fresh numbers on that nobody else really has ratings on. So that could be an opportunity for the books who know their stuff, also for the betters. And looking forward to the start of NASCAR season. So Daytona's coming up here in about a week and dive into that. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Well, the next big event would be just in a few weeks. March Madness will take a front and center stage here at the South Point and throughout Las Vegas. Not only the at the tournament itself, but it, it actually has grown to where the conference tournaments are, we're seeing a lot more betting activity with those. So starting with the beginning of March in the conference tournaments, right through the, the big dance at the final four in early April. 
March Madness in particular, the opening round, we have such handle and volume, people coming from all across the United States, especially at the Rampart and JW Marriott, a fabulous hotel. So we're looking forward to March Madness, and this year's field is wide, wide open. So definitely the opening round of March Madness will be our next biggest event, then followed by the Kentucky Derby. Naturally, the first Saturday in May will be our greatest day for horse racing to start the early 2019 year. Class is in session. It's time for Betting 101. Talking baseball with you here on the Vegas Stats and Information Network, Betting 101. He's Josh Towers. My name is Sam Panianovich. Good thing that we have a pitcher on the set here because I am far from a pitcher. That goes without being said. But the importance of pitching in baseball, not only the starting pitcher, Josh, but the bullpens as well. How many times have you bet a baseball team where your starter goes five, six innings, gives up a run or two, they give way to the bullpen, and it's Johnny Holstaff day, right? <laughs> the kid from AAA is up. The lefty that never pitches comes in. And all of a sudden, that two-run lead is now a two-run deficit. You have to not only know everything about the starting pitcher, how do they do against these teams, how do they face left-handers, right-handers, but... How does the bullpen behind them follow through? Very important. Very important. We now you got to remember a lot of these lines are based off of the starting pitchers that day. The, the the bookmakers aren't really taking into consideration the bullpen at all or the lineup. We don't know the lineup before these lines are posted. So really everything is based off of who's starting. So we know a lot about these pitchers. But what happened on the back end? You're right. And and how many starters go this day and age go complete games? It's a very rare thing. This is a bullpen age. The last couple of years it's become bullpens are a huge part of baseball. So God, we can go everywhere with this. But yeah, so when you're when you're betting these games, you've got to take into consideration the starter and then maybe look to see the average distance that he goes in games. That's five, it's six, it's seven innings today. And then now who's their bullpen? There's winning bullpens. There's losing bullpens, meaning the days are winning, certain guys come in, the days are losing, certain guys come in. You know, have they pitched back to back days? Have they not? Is the closer available? Is the closer available, right? And and at that point is the eighth inning guy because we have so many said closers these days. It, it becomes very important to, to look at everything and not just base it, although the line is made, not just base it strictly on the starting pitching. Yeah, several people will bet baseball and handicap baseball by just crunching the numbers, right? Putting them in a calculator or doing your formula, but you almost have to pay attention. Based I, I always say it this way. You can bet football every Saturday and every Sunday, and not much really changes over the course of the week. There are some injuries to monitor, but usually the quarterback is the same, right? The receivers are the same. Same with the linebackers and the safeties. With baseball, though, if a closer goes three out of four days, he's not going to be available on that fifth day. Well, and getting a little bit deeper, as a starting pitcher, let's say, Sammy, you're my normal catcher, and I, and you've caught me four games in a row. And I'm David all, Ross. You're David Ross. And then all of a sudden, today it's a day game, and now I have a catcher who I haven't had in a month. How's my relationship with him? You know, so there's a lot of things that factor in. It's not just, oh, Max Scherzer's pitching, and he's definitely going to win. There's a lot of things that you have to factor in when it comes to this. Jonesy, let's put up the game board again, Team A against Team B. Now, here are two ways that you can bet a baseball game as far as the pitchers go. You can just play action, which is just playing the game and rolling the dice. So no matter what happens with the pitcher, minus 150 team A, plus 140 team B. There's another option, though, and this is very popular in the global markets. You can list a pitcher or both starting pitchers, which means, Josh, if I check the box next to team A at minus 150 and Josh Towers is on the hill, that bet is only taken if you start that game, if you get scratched, if you have pain in your elbow, if you roll your ankle, if you fall down the dugout like Carlos Rodon did a couple times <laughs> with the White Sox, if you are no longer starting this game because I listed you as a pitcher, that bet is now void and you get a complete refund. Very important. This is very important, especially... If, if the reason you're betting this team today is because of the starting pitching, you love the matchup, you love where one guy is compared to where another guy is, if you're betting this game based on the matchup, I really and highly suggest you list your pitchers. I don't list too much because when I make a play on a game, I look into a lot of things, the lineups, where they've been, the bullpen, the fields. Uh, tra I look into a lot of different things. So I don't list quite as often. Uh, can turn into be a negative thing at times, but if you're betting strictly on the starting pitching, 
I highly suggest you list. So I know one of your favorite bets to make. We've talked about this. We've worked together over a year now. The first five inning bet. I like it. So take me through what a first five inning bet and why you think it's advantageous for you as a better. Okay. So as we're talking, you can bet the entire game. It's a, in, our, in our scenario, we have a minus 150 on the road, plus 140 at home. You can bet the entire game, nine innings, who's going to win this. In a five inning play, when the game's officially official, we can bet that as well. Who's going to win the first five innings of the game? Uh, lines are close, sometimes slightly altered, maybe another 10 or, or 20 cent difference. I started to like five inning bets a lot more the last couple of years because of how much bullpens have come into play. So when I got a James Paxton or, you know what, I got a Chasin from Milwaukee. Oh, yeah. He was fantastic. But Council would never let him go past five, six max. Five and a third. Five and right. two thirds. So I know the bullpen's coming into play with him on the mound, but I also know that he's been great. So I'm going to take a play on a five-inning game with Chasin if I don't feel the matchup the rest of the way is good or maybe the bullpen's been used a little bit too much lately in my liking. I'm going to play Chasin himself five innings because I know that he's probably going to get to those five on his own. So I'm betting this strictly on him and him alone. Now here's the issue with that. If yes. you do take the favorite and you're laying the first five, if you're tied, no dice, right? You have to be in front to win the bet. So if they're tied after five, you don't win. You, you don't lose. In front. You don't lose, correct. That's which a is, tie. Which is one of the rare things in baseball. It's one of the rare ties. I'm laying three in football and hands on three. We, we push. Uh, you you can push on a five-inning bet. I don't know if that uh, if that excites you, doesn't excite you, but there is that option now as well. But then if you take a team like with a bad bullpen but a great starter, for example, you take um, – Jacob DeGrom. Okay, there you go. There's a good starter. He's probably going to be about – if he's at home, he's going to be at least minus – well, maybe last year not as much, but – on average, DeGrom is about minus 175 or minus 180. Uh, first five-inning bet, probably about minus 135 or minus 140, maybe higher. It all depends on who he's facing and where he's facing him. Uh, that being said, though, you only get the first five innings. So if DeGrom throws goose eggs up for five, you get to the bullpen, doesn't matter. It's a five-inning bet only. Also, the overnight lines. This is something that happens usually the day before at about 11 o'clock in the morning globally. Before you go overnight, go back to DeGrom. So if DeGrom's, let's say, 180 at home, mm -hmm. in the first five, he's probably going to be minus 200 because they know that he's going to go the first five. They know how dominant he is. And he won the Cy Young last year with, what, maybe 10 wins? Mm -hmm. And so his bullpen blew a lot of his games. They had like a run and a half higher, two home runs higher. Because the ERA was insanely higher when Jacob pitched to when they didn't. So when you see that, we know how good Jacob is. That first five-inning line for him in particular might actually be a lot higher, knowing that he'll dominate and, dominate, and then when he turns it over, there's a chance because they had done it so often, they might blow that game for him. Do you know how many first fives I've bet in my life? No. None. Really, I enjoy it, man. I can tell. I can yeah. tell. You are the uh, first five experts. So back to the overnights. These usually come out, say that this is a Tuesday, usually Monday about 11 o'clock in the morning Pacific. That's when you start to see the offshore shops put up lines. Now, Josh, a lot can change from 11 o'clock in the morning the day before until first pitch the next day. Right. We often see these lines sometimes change 30 or 40 cents. So there are scalpers out there. There are people that love pitchers at certain prices. But you could see, for example, the Yankees could be minus 160 at home on the overnight, and by the time we get to first pitch the next day, they could be minus 200, minus 210. Right. Yeah, no, it, and that's what we had kind of briefly talked about uh, in the last segment. So when they put these lines out, they're really just putting them out based on the starting pitching. A couple other minor factors, but really based on the starting pitching, because if a line's coming out right now before tonight's game for tomorrow and you know some you know, variation of that you know you really don't know what's going on with the lineup you don't know if anybody in that particular game got hurt you really don't know who's going to be used tonight how deep the game's going to go so these guys are really just basing these lines off the starting pitching so once again be careful if that's just what you're betting or if you're going to get a little bit deeper into what you're actually going to lay your money on. I've learned a lot working with Kenny White here at oh, Beeson. Genius. And I had asked it because I was always curious. Now, every player is worth a point to Kenny because he gives every person a value point that's in football, basketball, hockey, and okay. baseball. I had asked him, all right, say Mike Trout is scratched for the Angels. How much is Mike Trout to the line? And I thought, you know, maybe 10 cents. I thought maybe if the Angels were minus 130, there's no Trout. Now it's minus 120. Kenny said the best players in baseball, like a Mike Trout, maybe a Bryce Harper, they could be worth 20 or 25 cents. He said one time Trout was scratched in a game against Oakland. The line moved 30 cents the other way. There's a lot that comes into that as well. 
No, really, it, it, it comes. Now, Trout's a little bit different. He's, he's arguably the best player in the game. But there's okay. Let's say Bryce Harper's not in the lineup today. We're talking positional players only, Correct. not starters, because a starter drop off could be a dollar. That's different. Yeah, we're talking about positional players. So let's say Bryce Harper's in the lineup today, but he's facing Chris Sell. Now Chris Sell's left-handed drops down a little bit, maybe a little bit harder matchup for a lefty. So we pull Bryce out of the game. Chris Sell's probably a bad example, but we pull, we pull Bryce out of the game, and we put in a right-handed version of somebody who could play the outfield. Uh, the lineup might have actually got better, although their best player is out of the game. But Bryce might be getting an off day versus a righty. Uh, that's a little bit different. Now, you're right, the price can change in a negative way because you have one of the better players in the lineup not in there today. So it does start to depend on that. I've, I've seen a lot of games where I mentioned, like, all right, Bryce is out of the game, and now you start to shy away. But then you realize that the guy replacing him is actually – having a pretty good week or a pretty good month. And now I have one of the best players in the game ready to come off the bench when I need him in a late inning situation. And so now there might actually be a little bit more value to that as well. All depends. Adam Dunn, 2012 White Sox. When the lefty was on the mound and Adam Dunn was in the lineup, you're right. Take Dunn out. He struck out a million times that year. The White Sox were a better lineup against lefties when they benched Adam Dunn. And two years ago with the Nationals when they had Adam Lynn who hit 312, I think, with like 20 off the bench. When there was a righty and they needed to, or uh, yeah, when there's a righty and they needed to give, you know, a righty a break, they got to put Lynn in, and Lynn can play the outfield. He can play first, and he was hitting really well. So they might have actually got stronger as well. So now we goes into are we looking at the depth on the bench as much as we look at the depth in the bullpen? And we talked about how much is Mike Trout, Bryce Harper worth to the line. I saw a game last year, and this is when Kershaw had the uh, the back spasms and missed a couple of weeks with the Dodgers. Yep. There was an overnight line set. Dodgers were at home, Dodger Stadium. I believe Kershaw was about minus 320 in that game. Say it's against the Rockies or the D-backs or the Giants. Kershaw got scratched that night. And they took the line down. Dodgers went from minus 320 to minus 130 <laughs> with Jimmy Jim Bob Jones on the hill. Some guy from double A. And so, depending if you listed or not, depending on whether you had a negative and the game is voided or a positive and you're still playing that game as well. So you're right. That's that's Those are the some of the cons of betting early. It's a nice surprise when you wake it's, up the next morning. Depends on if you won the game or not. <laughs> no, I'm saying you didn't list the pitcher overnight. Oh, yeah. You thought you had Kershaw on a parlay, last leg of the parlay, and now you got some guy from double A. A little dangerous. Yeah, yeah. I like also, now that you bring that up briefly, um, guys that are making their first ever major league start, it goes one of two ways. They usually dominate or they get rocked. They don't have a mediocre outing. And the reason the majority of the time they dominate is because the lineup has never seen it before. They don't know what they're, they're go to. Do they attack us right away? What do they put us away with? So by the time the hitters go two, three at bats and they fill them out, that dude usually had a pretty good game and now he's off. And now we bring in the bullpen. So you'll see lines favor not the guy making his major league debut, but the other team. And there might be value on the major league guy that day. We'll come back. We'll talk about win totals. How do you bet win totals? Also, the future prices here in Las Vegas. He's Josh Towers. I'm Sam Panionovich. We're talking baseball here on Betting 101. If you didn't catch Beeson last week, here's some of what you missed. Yeah, I love it. Uh, the Rockies are my favorite one. Like I said, if you got it at 82, congratulations. I hope you bet a lot. The Rockies are my favorite. I like the Mets over. I think it's still too low for that division. I think they're really good. I, I love the whole division. And the Phillies. I know the Phillies are a little bit high, but this team is good, got better, and we're talking about the potential landing spot of one of those two guys, and now they're the front front runner to get JT Real Muto. That's one that I would definitely take a shot on. It's worth it. I'm not giving up, Jeff. I, I, I have both guys. I think Freak is right there. I think it's neck and neck, and I think Freak can absolutely win this award. Well, I think he can, too. I mean, I think there's a lot of people that don't like the style of play that, that Harden does, mm. but we have to shape it based on what the perception and everything driven and what you see what Harden does on a nightly basis, and it's basically at the forefront of everything NBA from an individual standpoint. And that's where the money comes in like that. We've had Antetokounmpo at 7-2 for a while now, and there's some small wages on him. But actually, Paul George has been picking up and getting more wagers outside of those two guys. So, you know, it, it's 
it's just a, a tough thing right now with how those guys are positioned. Harden doing what he's doing on a nightly basis and Ted Okumpo right there, I think it's going to be between those two guys. But it, it's hard to shape it any different than what we have in the future, book. We struggled against some zone defenses. We became less aggressive. Uh, we were too passive. We played what we call high school hairy basketball where we kept the ball above our heads. We weren't in triple threat position to score, shoot, dribble, pass. And so what we did, Michael, is we went back and started studying uh, FIBA national teams from other countries. Um, Greece in 2009 ran an incredible zone offense against China. Uh, and so we tried to pick, pick apart different pieces of, of, of philosophies from a zone offensive standpoint. Now we're, we're equally as good against zone as we are man-to-man, and I think that's been the turning point for us from an offensive standpoint. Class is in session. It's time for Betting 101. We are teaching you how to bet baseball here, Betting 101. My name is Sam Panionovich here on VEASAN, Sirius XM 204, VEASAN.com, and Fubo TV. Coming up in this segment, I've got the sheet from the South Point. These are the future odds. Odds to win the pennant, AL and NL, and odds, of course, to win the World Series. But we start with the win total bet, and I start with a very, very unfortunate story last season when, Josh, I beat a win total move by six wins. The White Sox win total last year opened 66 and a half, and I went over, which means you have to have 67 wins or more. And these are bets that are locked in when you bet them. So if the number moves like the White Sox total did, you have the number that you got down on. I bet over 66 and a half wins with the White Sox. Tell me how that total got bet all the way up to 73. So I had six and a half wins <laughs> in my pocket. I'm already, that money's already spent. And the White Sox, I believe last year, won 62 or 63 games. All I know is they didn't go over. 62. But there's a lesson here that if you have a pulse on a team, the other team that went up last year was the Milwaukee Brewers. They were bet up a whole lot. They were buyers at the deadline. So you have to bet these when they come out knowing full well that they're going to move. And if you can project or forecast said move, you have to get down before that move happens. Yeah, so on the flip side, uh, I talked about this a lot last year with the totals. I only bet one. There's a lot that I liked. I only bet one. It was the Dodgers under, and the number was really high because of what they did the year before. I thought a lot of people had career years, although I did feel this team was still pretty good. I thought a lot of players had career years, and I just didn't see that team being as good. I'm actually shocked at how well they did, not necessarily against the World Series, but win total because they had a little stretch where they were awesome. But they never got to the number, and it got bet down a little bit. It opened 96 and a half yeah. or 97. I got it under 96 and a half, and I got it under 95 and a half. It opened again this year at 95. I think it's down to 93 and a half now. Um, and they didn't quite get there. And the reason I didn't venture to any of the other plays is because I like that one so much. I just stuck with that one. Um, and this year I saw one. There's a couple that I like this year that I think the number's kind of fair. Now, listen, learn about your teams, understand who they lost, understand who they picked up. But the Cardinals, I thought, got so much better this year, and their number's around 88 and a half. I think that's a great number. I think that if they win their division, they're going to have to win more than 88 games. I think they have a better team this year. I like that. There's um, there's a there's a couple other. I mean, for instance, your White Sox. The number now because they added Kelvin Herrera, they added John Jay, they added McCann, they added Colome, they added Lon, uh, Yonder Alonso, they added Ivan Nova. There are discussions with Manny Machado. You know, they went 62 last year. Obviously, not a good year. Really young team. They're up to 77 this year already to start. So we'll start with this Central Division. We're going to hit all the divisions here, Jonesy. We're going to kind of play pin the tail on the donkey with these win totals. So the win total is simple. Here's the number. Is this team going to go over the win total or under? And I think it's also important, Josh, to think about the team as a whole. Are they going to be buying or selling at the deadline? Now, that's not easy to predict, uh, but some teams you know they're rebuilding. Like the White Sox last year, they were selling guys off. Other teams, Yankees, Red Sox, likely going to be buyers. So here are your five teams in the American League Central, and these are the numbers that Vegas thinks they're going to win. Indians, 90 and a half, and you have the hook there, so there's not going to be a tie at this number, over 90 and a half or under 90 and a half. Minnesota Twins win total 85. The aforementioned White Sox open 74 and a half, and they have been bumped up now to 77. 
Royals, not so great. 68 and a half. And the Tigers, 67 and a half. Indians number seems a little high. I think this division is wide open. I would be going under the higher and over the lower. That White Sox win total, I would have liked 74 and a half. But as we said, you have to bet it before the move. It's already been knocked up two and a half wins. Right. So we're looking at the opening and we're looking at the current correct. So, yeah, I think the Indians are a good team. I still think they're the best team in this division. But if you look at some of their moves, you know, they lost Michael Brantley. They added Santana Bowers from Tampa's over here. If you look at some of their moves and what they're trying to do, they keep talking about some trades. And and now you got Lindor, who's out for st- almost all of spring training, if not all of spring training. I thought this number was too high to start with. I don't think that this team is as good as it was, although their pitching is fantastic. So when I saw 91 and a half, factoring in some of these things, under is the first thing that came into mind. But you play your division 18, 19 times a year. And so you just said bottom it, half. the White Sox got better. The Twins... They got Nelson Cruz and Jonathan Scope and Torres. They added Perez and Parker and C.J. Crone. They added players. They got better. Their manager comes from Tampa Bay with Kevin Cash, who's been fantastic. Uh, last year's manager was not very good. They were too inconsistent with him. And so, by default, in my opinion, the Twins got better. The Royals and the, and the Tigers still bring up the rear. I don't see those guys getting to their win total. I think they're worse. But when you add two teams in your division that got better, you've made some moves money-wise – I definitely see what you're saying. I like the over with the White Sox. I like the under with the Indians. The Twins number, I don't know about 85, buddy. Flip the coin. If that's the case, don't bet it. Guess what? You don't have to bet it if you don't want. But it still makes me, by looking at this, it makes me like the under of the Indians even more. Let's go to the American League East, and you know who's at the top. The heavy hitters at the top, the Boston Red Sox. And the New York Yankees, they always have high totals. The Yankees total 98 right now. That's been bet up from 96 and a half. So the Yankees 98, the Red Sox 97, world champs are 97 over under. Rays at 84, one of the best managers in the game with Kevin Cash. Blue Jays 72 and a half. And oh, look at that number on the O's. Josh Towers. 58 win total for the Baltimore Orioles. Man, I look at the Orioles who brought <laughs> That's a 40, 40 win drop off from the Yankees to the Orioles. So sad. I, I mean, the bottom two teams are the two teams I spent majority of my career with. Luckily, I got to throw the Yankees in for a second, so it's kind of cool. I, I was in the Orioles locker room last week, and I looked at all the name badges, the name plates around the whole locker room, and I really, I, I, I follow a lot of baseball, Sammy. I didn't know almost all the guys in there. There's a few guys that I, I recognize as a kid that went to UNLV named Dean Kramer, who's, who's you know, have a chance to sh- show off some stuff. Obviously, your Chris Davises and your, your Cobbs, who's going to have a much better year. I didn't recognize the majority of this roster. And I just, in, unless that coaching staff got that much better and they have a better system in place, I can't see the Orioles. By default, you should win more games than they did last year. Tough to lose 100. I can't see them being very good. Um, the Jays... Listen, the Jays, I, I understand why that they went from 76 and a half to 72 and a half already. I don't see what Toronto's bringing to the table as well. The other three game, teams, you got to remember, the Yankees are always going to be up there. The, the New York Yankees, they always put a winning product on. They got a lot better. Boston Red Sox, an amazing manager, a great guy, uh, group of guys. That's a fair number for them. They won the World Series 108 games last year, but they also lost Kelly. They lost Kimbrel, their eighth and ninth inning guys. They added nobody to the team yet. Do they have enough? We know the bullpen was the weakest spot. Do they have enough to get back to 90s, the back end, because the rotation's awesome, have enough? That's a tough number for me. And then you look at Tampa. Tampa's gotten better. Every year that Kevin Cash has been there, they won 90 games last year, and now they actually went and spent some money. And they got Morton and Garcia from your White Sox. You know very well he can hit. Zunino as a catcher, Pagan. They got better. So when we're looking at totals, like you said, you bet this total, it's locked in. Now you root for 162 games. You got to look at the entire divisions and see who got better around it when that's a majority of my game. And if you want to get a little bit more advanced, look to see who the interleague schedule is as well. American League West, let's go there. Here on Betting 101 on VSIN, we know who's on the top. Houston Astros, win total open 97 and a half, Josh. That's been bet down a little bit. Astros 96. You've got the Angels at 84. How about the Athletics? They have left over the Angels. The A's 84 and a half. Mariners 69 and a half. 
and the Rangers 71 and a half. But if you look to the right side of that column, there's been a lot of move here. The Mariners win total has already been bet down five wins from 74 and a half to 69 and a half. All right. So I know we're talking gambling, but I want to ask a question real quick to you. When you think about the Angels and you think about the athletics, who's a better team to you? Oakland. Not even close. You didn't even, you didn't even hesitate. You didn't flinch. Am I right? I'm just saying. I mean, you didn't even flinch. But okay, no. So I would have said the same thing. But yet, let me see that graphic again. You got the Angels bet up to 84, and Oakland's at 84 and a half bet up to 84. They open the lines as if the Angels are better. I can't. The Angels haven't been very good to me in a long time. They won 80 games last year. They added Cahill and Harvey and Allen. I understand it. Uh, Lou Croy and Bohr. But they also brought in Brad Osmith. Brad, when he was in Detroit as the manager, did not do a good job. He was not a very good manager. And so when I see this Angels team that doesn't have any starting pitching, the bullpen's okay, and your offense outside of Michael Trout is about the same. They're, to me, they're, you're, you're, you either dominate when you pitch to them because they're the same, or they're a bad matchup for you and they get you. Either way, I don't see an Angel team being a 500-win team, and they're definitely, in my opinion, not better than Oakland, who got better as well. So going back to looking at the divisions, where are these wins and losses coming from? And then you look at the Mariners, who dropped five games already. I think people just saw all the moves they made, and they assumed they got worse. This team did not get worse. Are they going to win as many games as they did last year, 89, and they faltered in the year? I don't know. But I promise you they're going to win more in 69. This is a good team. Let's zip through the National League quickly here. The win totals for the National League West. You went under last year with the Dodgers. And again, another high number for the L.A. Dodgers. For Big Blue, Dodgers 93.5. And and then a nice little drop-off here. The Rockies at 86. That's been bet up from 82 to 86. Padres, 75.5. Same with the Giants, 75.5. And And the D-backs at 74. To the Central we go. This is very interesting. This division this year... I wouldn't be surprised if it's the Cardinals, yes. the Brewers, or the Cubs. Cubs 92, Cardinals 88 and a half, Brewers 87 and a half, and then the Reds at 77. But that's that's a pretty high total given where they were last year. Pirates bring up the rear 76 and a half. Who's your favorite here in the Central? What do you think? Uh, Cardinals, without a doubt. I know the Cubs are good and they get Darvish back. Hopefully, uh, it's not even in question to me. The Cardinals are by far the best team. I don't think the Brewers can repeat. The Cubs have been doing it for a while, and they're good. People have started to get their number. But the Cardinals are the one team that went out and just got better from every aspect of their game, and it's very impressive. I think that number's wrong, just like, and I wish with the West, I wish I would have got the Rockies at 82. You're telling me they're a 500 team? They can easily win that division. I think the Rockies' number and the Cardinals' numbers are low, and I really like those overs. Last division, the National League East. And this is a division where you have the Nationals, 88 and a half. Look at this one. We still don't know about Bryce Harper. We don't know where he's going to go. 88 and a half on the Nationals, 88 and a half on the Phillies, who have been bet up, Josh, from 83 to 88 and a half. Braves, 86 and a half. Mets, 85 and a half. And then there's the Marlins down at 64. But this is saying, Vegas is saying, good luck picking this division winner. I, I, I think it's right for the show. I think if you put them all at the same to start, that was fair. The Marlins aren't going to get to 64, in my opinion. I don't know. They, they got worse. They lost. In my opinion, outside of pitching, probably the best player in the game in JT Real Muto, who they just gave to the Phillies. The Phillies, by far, to me, are the favorites to win the National League this year and go to the World Series now that they picked him up with or without adding Machado or Harper. Harper would be a better addition than Manny because they got Gene Segura. Remember, they added a lot of people. That team's amazing, but every one of those teams outside of the Marlins got better, and I love it, and I think there's value there. When we come back, we'll look at the pennant odds, the World Series odds, and maybe a prediction or two for 2019. This is Betting 101 on VEASAN. I think two sports will actually see an increase in betting. College basketball has become much more popular in recent years, particularly with March Madness 
Uh, but I think that will continue to grow. And I think we'll see an increase in golf as well, head-to-head -head matchups and the adjusted prices from the first round through the fourth round. So I think college basketball will continue to we'll see growth there, and I think golf as well. Uh, you know, one of the areas that I think that has the potential for some uh, growth uh, for the betters in the future is um, probably as we expand into uh, other areas in the United States with some of our properties is soccer. Um, I think there's a big appetite for uh, soccer uh, in, in on the East Coast. We've seen that already with our Borgata property. So um, I think soccer will, uh, you know, everyone keeps saying it's going to be the next big thing. I think it's got the potential now to be the next big thing for betters. No, I think from a from a percentage standpoint, if we want to you know look at it that way for handle, I see soccer. Soccer's really grown the last couple of years. Uh, hockey has as well. Uh, that I mean, obviously directly correlated with the uh, Vegas Golden Knights here. We see that kind of flatten out a little bit this year, but it's still growing a little bit. But I think soccer really has the best chance to to grow uh, significantly from a percentage standpoint. <laughs> Uh, in terms of sports that are really starting to gain traction, I think as you see sports betting um, expanding to the states and getting more popular, you're going to see niche sports start to pick up. So I really anticipated growth in maybe golf betting, NASCAR betting. Those seem to be some of the sports that I think that go hand in hand with wagering. So looking forward to some of the smaller sports picking up steam. I definitely see an all sports handle increase on all sports, not just one in particular. We have seen a growth in soccer over the past years, interest in EPL as we offer more and more, also interest in the United States based soccer leagues. But as uh, growth in the industry and more and more states legalize sports gambling, I could see massive increases in NFL, college football baseball, basketball throughout the United States, and I cannot segregate just one sport as an increased sport. Class is in session. It's time for Betting 101. Class is almost over. Josh Towers, the professor. My name is Sam Panionovich here, Betting 101 on VEASAN. The last part of our show here, and we hope you enjoyed it, is how to bet on futures. And we'll start with the American League, then the National League pennants. Jonesy, let's pop up the AL pennant and the odds to win. So here's what you do. Let's say I give you $100, and I say here's what you do. Pick the winner of the American League. Your $100 turns into $275 if you bet on the Red Sox to win the pennant, and it comes true. Astros, same price, same with the Yankees. All those teams, Boston, Houston, and New York, are plus 275 to win the AL pennant. Indians, $100 would make you 500. Then the A's at 12 to 1, the Rays and White Sox at 15, the Angels at 20, and the following teams on the right, Twins, Blue Jays 30, Rangers 50, and then the rest. National League, here are the futures for the National League pennant, and we know the Dodgers and Astros, or the Dodgers, excuse me, Astros used to be in the uh, National League. Dodgers plus 350, then the Nationals 4 to 1, the Cubbies and Cardinals right there at 5 to 1, so 100 wins you 500 on those teams. Brewers 6 to 1, Braves 6 to 1, the Phillies 7 to 1, the Mets 10 to 1, Rockies 15, Pirates 30, Reds 35 and the Giants are 40 to 1. Josh, if I were to toss this to you and say does anything jump out, AL or NL pennant, any prices that are enticing in your opinion? Uh, on the AL sheet, I would have said on the right side, don't bet any of those teams stay away. Okay. Uh, keep in mind, it's not like a coin flip where we're saying uh, in essence, it is. But okay, I'm going to take the Rays. I think they're going to win the pennant this year for the American League at 15 to one. Um, and you kind of, in essence, got to get lucky. Remember, if the A, if the Rays get to that game, and they're facing whoever, now you have a way to hedge, which is for another conversation, to actually make yourself money. So they don't necessarily have to win the AL pennant or the NL pennant. They need to get there for you to profit. So there, there's a lot more that goes into this than that. Um, and here's the other thing. If you're in love with the team and you think this is the team, yes, there's, there's value on this board, but there's 162 games in a season. Teams go through hot streaks. They go through cold streaks. You know, Pittsburgh always starts off well and then they fade. So maybe the team you love goes 500 for the first two weeks of the season and you can find a better odds or a better odd 
once the season starts as well. So there's multiple ways to bet winning the pennant, winning the World Series, uh, or actually winning your division as well. And how about last year where the Dodgers got off to a really, really slow start? They were at one point 20 to 1 to win the pennant and 40 to 1 to win the World Series. And that was in mid May. It started about, what, 4 to 1, I would say? Oh, yeah, four to one. Yeah. Same as this number right here, plus 350. So there was no value early in the season for some, but you played through the slump the first 60 games or so, first 70 games. They were awful last year, and the price was reflective of that. Last part of our show here, the World Series odds. These are odds to win the whole enchilada. And you look at the top of this list, the Yankees at plus 550. Red Sox and Astros, 6-1. to one. Same with the Dodgers. Four teams are 10 to 1, the Indians, Cubs, Nationals and Cardinals, so you bet 100 to win 1000. Braves and Brewers 12 to 1, Phillies 15, the Mets at 20 and the A's and Rockies 25, Rays are 30. Josh, we got a minute left to go. Uh, any predictions, anything you like here whether it's pennant World Series future or the win total. You talked about Philly. I know you love the Phillies yeah. this year. In my personal opinion, when it comes to the World Series odds, it's six to one, ten to one. I don't think that you should jump early on this. I think you should wait for the season to play out. Let them win and lose a couple games. You're definitely going to get better odds, in my opinion, as the season goes. That's just for World Series and A and N predictions. Um, I told everybody the team that got Real Muto is winning the World Series. I think the Phillies are going to get there now. I, I truly do, and they still may more, make more moves. I like that team. The Rockies got better, even though they only added one player. Mike Dunn's healthy. The bullpen, who is a veteran bullpen, got better. There's some value there. I love what the Cardinals did. You guys know that already. There's a, there's a lot of things. So I, I think the Yankees, 